Kia ora, greetings and welcome to Green Planet FM 104.6. I'm Tim Lynch and I trust that you are doing well. I invite you to stay with me over the next hour as we discuss and find ways to take care of our unique and magnificent Green Planet Earth. Green Planet FM is premised on environment, health and consciousness. Yet we have always endeavoured to cover all the realms of existence within the biosphere of our home planet, our great sustainer. And Lisa Eyre recently did two superb interviews with Alindon Burford and Tim Wright and they were both based around how to disarm the world that's spending over a trillion dollars on arms where half of that would actually allow all 7.4 billion human beings to solve all our problems of environmental destruction, health, education, especially holistic understandings, and clean up our air, clean up our water, clean up our food chain, and find housing for everybody, find new energy propulsion systems for ground, water and air transport, and allow people to find work that is local and sustainable, and in particular, fulfilling work, and community-oriented. But what I really want to cover is a peace conference that's coming up here on the 19th and 20th of September. It's called World Without War Action for Peace Conference, and it's going to be at Sir Paul Rees Building, AUT University, Auckland. This is going to be a very unique conference around peace. The elusive peace that at heart we all wish for, but due to circumstances we've been distracted, that we've really forgotten to feel at peace. And what is peace? I'm going to be interviewing a special person. He is known as a philosopher, reverend, writer, peace campaigner, academic and an advocate for values and ethics and education is Dr. John Hinchcliffe a companion of New Zealand Order of Merit for Services to Education and he has edited many books in the fields of professional ethics nuclear disarmament, sport philosophy and religion and AUT is proud to have Dr. John Hinchcliffe as the first Emeritus Vice Chancellor of AUT Auckland University of Technology. In the studio this morning, I have John Hinchcliffe. I wish to welcome him here today. And so, kia ora, John, thank you for coming into the studio and sharing a very important message with New Zealanders and the world at large. Uh, kia ora, good morning. It is a privilege and pleasure to be here. And I would like to just talk about the Peace Foundation for a minute or two. In the mid-1970s, a gentleman by the name of John Mayle, a former diplomat, believed it was necessary for more people to understand what was happening in the world. So he called a group of us, including professors and workers in the church and so on, together so that we might develop a way of getting the message across, getting the understanding into people's minds. So he set up the Peace Foundation, aiming to get a chair of peace studies at the University of Auckland. This was an uphill and difficult and eventually unsuccessful task. Recently, however, Otago University has developed a brilliant leader and it's going particularly well. The uh, Peace Foundation since then has mostly focused on, on violence in schools and violence in the home. There's an outstanding program. There's been about 140 New Zealand schools where students are seen as peers responsible for keeping peace and harmony in the playground. They learn how to break up fights and how to bring people together. The other one is looking at violence in the home. Again, trying to find ways that the couple can be joint peacemakers. Today, that's still our main focus, although we're spending a lot of time preparing for a peace conference. This is substantially based on action proposals. The ancient philosopher Aristotle said theory was pointless unless it translated into action. So we have about 42 presenters. It would be hopeless to get them all to give a learned discussion on their own field of understanding and genius. 
what we want them to do is just to speak half the time describing the context of their ideas, then propose actions that we in New Zealand could take and perhaps move internationally and join different groups. Joining groups that are already involved in the action and if not, then try and develop our own initiatives if and when it's possible. So this is based around disarmaments. Now we're escalating the situation because the world is very challenged at the moment. The Cold War seems to have been ramped up more. So we're wanting to eliminate and ban nuclear weapons? This is just one strand of our program. You know, nuclear weapons is made a lot of fuss of with just cause. There's between about 16,500 and 20,000 nuclear weapons spread over nine countries and it's a serious threat. John Kennedy at the Bay of Pigs time said there's a one in three chances of it escalating to a worldwide nuclear war. So it is a problem. But there are other issues that are just as much a problem, if not more so. You can look at biotechnology and see what they're developing in terms of germ warfare and viruses that can spread through a world population, animal population. There are drones, for example, that can drop a payload of nuclear weapons and travel for 82 hours in space, uh, virtually undetectable because they can travel at ground level. Then there is artificial intelligence where the machines, the computers, can do what we can't do. They can be fit onto robots or warheads that can have their own particular way of finding the targets. Deep worry here is that their intelligence, their artificial intelligence, could be interfered with or go haywire and they could turn their evil onto the world population. Robots will be a focus, but also we're looking in terms of what we can do through education, what can we do through religion and politicians. We have the Mayor of Wellington coming up and 42 different speakers representing a wide range of expertise of people that are concerned about the future and are wishing to share with us their beliefs about what we can do. The US military mentioned full-spectrum domination, which covers so many different contingencies, John, that they've looked at as above and then below and from any other region as well. And as you've mentioned, with bacterial and viral and particularly radio frequencies and robots, this conference that you're going to be involved with, the Peace Foundation, this is a world leader in many ways because we have to grapple, we have to grab that challenge, haven't we? Indeed, it's so much more dangerous now than we could have imagined. Actually, in 1976, some of us organised a sell-out conference in the Wellington Town Hall. We had 40 international speakers. Again, it was based on action. And there were one or two things that came out of it, but not many. The town hall, as I said, was packed. This time, it's extremely difficult to get people to come. I think people are tired of it, want to bury their heads in the sand, or instead of being paranoid about it, they're sort of wanting to hide away and not know anything about it. So that's part of our problem. How can we mobilise people to get involved? And it does mean taking on a huge powers, the military-industrial complex. I mean, presidents can't do it. Jimmy Carter tried, and he, after he left, failed. Eisenhower said... Our greatest danger is the military-industrial complex. Obama can't get anywhere with his gun control. So even the politicians in America are stymied by corporate interest and this don't-care attitude and don't-know attitude. So it's a deep problem. Things are getting worse exponentially. I mean, computers can do so much more than they could four or five years ago and it won't be long before hundreds of thousands of calculations and data can be controlled within seconds. It's just mind-boggling where it's all going. Well, quite frankly, it's easy to be pessimistic for the grandchildren. One of our challenges that we've found, and here we are at Planet FM and this program at Green Planet FM, is media coverage. Media has been taken up by vested interests and 
whereas 10 years ago there was something like about 60 different media companies or corporations in the USA. Now they're down to six. And when you have a look at all those six, they are deeply embedded in either the military industrial situation or they've got big banking conglomerates behind them. So we're not hearing, it's not been languaged, particularly from our political centre or across the nightly news. As you say, people have just got bored or too distracted with so many other distractions, titillation and glamour and celebrity being some of them. I totally agree, Tim. It's a huge challenge for us to know what to do. We do have someone speaking from the media point of view at our conference. But this morning the headlines was another tragedy, more people killed, and people do get titillated by this, it seems. Often in the back section on the world news, I find little titbits that are deeply worrying. Because of this infatuation with trivia, it keeps the politicians um, out of framework and into making decisions, which can cause problems. It was Geoffrey Palmer, the former Prime Minister, who said, it's time now for governments to set aside because they can't do anything and people to get involved, people to take the challenge. Eisenhower said exactly the same thing. We look at the Security Council of the United Nations with all their money, with all their power in terms of presidents and prime ministers and different agencies, with all the huge monies they spend on their operation, what are they able to do with the power of veto? Why is it that the Pope could broker the deal between the United States and Cuba to overcome that problem? Why was it the Vice President of the States could talk with a couple of European countries and get them to break the deadlock with nuclear weapons? So we need everybody everywhere to make a connection and a commitment and an engagement. We never know precisely what little thing we can do that can move mountains. There's a beautiful saying about a snowflake the snows had dropped on the branch of this tree and finally one little snowflake was enough to upset the balance and the branch came tumbling down in the last few weeks newspapers the story of this little three-year-old boy getting drowned that's mobilized people like nothing else but out of tragedy of course comes this commitment and we never can do much but if we all work together we could do a great amount. Michelangelo, when he was carving the beautiful statue David, was asked how he did it. And he said, just by chipping away at the edges. <laughs> so we do need to chip away at the edges to break that branch with our tiny contribution. Every one of us can do something. Citizen diplomacy, John, I find that a very empowering thing to do. I ended up in 1986 during Glasnost and Perestroika going to Moscow. And during that seven days that I was there, I met the U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union not once but twice. And I had lunch with a cultural attaché to Sweden. Uh, So, And I met some very interesting people, a lot of synchronicities, quite a lot of magic happened. But it can happen once we commit. Absolutely. There's nothing I can say to add to that. You said it beautifully. And so how can New Zealanders get involved more, John? I know writing letters. I was just listening to two superb interviews that Lisa Eyre did in the last three months, one with Lyndon Burford and the other with Tim Wright, on just the nuclear issues on Green Planet FM, and they were excellent. They were very, very interesting interviews. And Lisa mentioned, she said that somewhere along the line, if maybe 10 letters are written specifically to a government official, that's enough for them to sit up and think, gee, there's 10 people from across the nation. And so if we could get 20 or 30 letters sent to a particular government person presumably the Prime Minister would be best, to let them know, because they do acknowledge that there is something going on, they may not do anything about it. But you see, John, I spend a lot of time, and no doubt you would have spent mega hours in writing letters and communicating with people, 
during your own time where you have to give away. It's a great sacrifice. And what we're really asking for is for people to say, OK, I've had my cake and eat it in many cases because New Zealand is a very fortunate country. We're so incredibly complacent at many levels. Can we not take 30 minutes out of our life just today to write a letter, not an email, a letter, and send it to a person of interest in this country? Tim, that's so important. Let me say it's not a sacrifice. I'm happy to help build a better future for my grandchildren. That's what's driving me. But letter writing is important. I would think if we could have a one-page statement describing how nuclear weapons, robots, artificial intelligence, cyber warfare, all of things are threatening us and perhaps attaching a very short article from The Guardian or from the group that's being founded by... Stephen Hawking's and Elon Musk, who's probably the wealthiest person in the world, and a thousand others who have written a letter uh, calling the world to stop the process of artificial intelligence, which they say is going to wreck the world. I think I would go further than writing letters. I think that is essential. I certainly would not interested in marching down the streets or calling up one, two, three, four, stop the war or something. I think we've got to hit them where it hurts most, and that's in the pocketbook. And one of my recommendations is that we find out precisely which companies are making even the smallest contribution to any of the dangers we face and then call people to boycott that company internationally until they are prepared to stop adding their contribution. Even a university that may be getting money from the nuclear arms race or the the Pentagon or whatever. During the Vietnam War, 70% of the research money was funded by the Pentagon. So if we looked at the research interests of the teachers and perhaps give them a rough time if they're focused on anything dangerous, we should look at the donor system of a university and challenge them and perhaps call the students to do a boycott of some classes or boycott paying fees or one of these things, but certainly the target should be on even small corporations that may just add a a little bolt to the system. We need to focus on them, challenge them, not just with words, but with actions. I most definitely agree, John. What about academics? Academics are throughout the university systems in the world, and I've noted in the last 15, 20 years, they've closed down a lot, that they were more involved once, but academics seem to be fearful of losing their tenure at a university if they come out strongly on certain issues. Yes, I'm not just sure what the answer there is, whether their tenure is threatened, and I think it was easier in the early days. In fact, the world's first conference attacking the dropping of nuclear weapons happened about a day after the Hiroshima bomb who was through the philosophy department of Canterbury University. And I think in New Zealand we have been more willing to stand out, to speak out, to sail our boats out against the submarines and nuclear warships that would neither confirm or deny whether they had nuclear weapons. But today the emphasis seems to be on more on research than really focusing on the needs of the students, packing them into large lecture theatres, giving something that could be given through the internet is not so good, in my view. What is important is that they meet into the Oxford-style tutorials so they can really think through the issues. The focus on research is really only about 100 years old, and now it's almost everything. You've got to publish or perish, even though only one article out of four is read by anyone else than the author and the editor. This compulsion to publish, I think, should also have a constraint, and that is you should look at issues that are important to our future. Why write a learned dissertation on the lovemaking of Eskimos in the 17th century when you could write something about the the sociological impact of cyber warfare on the Saudi Arabia, whose whole system was hijacked by Israel? because the Israelis thought that Saudi Arabia had attacked them. It wasn't in the end, it was some other agency. 
They lost 400,000 emails and so on. That's what Israel did. And I don't think they've ever found the guilty party. That's just a minor illustration of where there are hundreds of issues that research could be extremely valuable. And I'd like to see perhaps the Peace Foundation writing to academics who choose meaningful topics a nice um, a letter of appreciation in gold print and so on just to stimulate this emphasis. Very true, John. I went to my niece's graduation in the Aotea Centre for honours and her master's degree and I listened to all the subject matter that many of the people did use for doing their PhD and they were inane subjects. Mm. They were subjects that were just total worthless. They had no relevance in today's world. And here, using all this mind power to basically spend a whole year researching trash and rubbish, mm. it's astonishing. Yeah, that would be in the majority, but there are still a strong minority of people that are concerned. At our conference, we have some academics from AUT, quite a few actually, we've got a couple from Auckland University and one of the keynote speakers is from Waikato University and Victoria University is another one. So there are those willing to take a stand but as you say, so many of them are talking about such esoteric subjects that very few people can understand them. In fact, what worries me is you get one academic writing an esoteric document, a professor in the next room doing one entirely different and they can't really communicate. And this is a problem, I think, the breaking down into tiny, discrete parts rather than seeing it holistically and seeing it as relative. You mentioned the key word holistic, John. I mean, the whole system has to be seen from a holistic point of view. We have everybody in in government or local government and in in national government, and they're in their own silos, and they're not cross-communicating and cross-pollinating among all the other government departments either. There seems to be this penchant for wanting to go down this tunnel and become in the end tunnel visioned. Yes, it could go further and say that in order to get ahead, you've got to research in an area that's pretty new. So you make sure it's discreet, easy to manage, and it loses that holistic approach. Going back to the weapons of mass destruction, or someone said weapons of mass extermination, you can see that these things all interconnect. Artificial intelligence into robots, cybernetics into the exoskeleton that we can wear that can make us run further and faster and and so on. There's a interconnection with so many of these areas and we need to all interconnect here in New Zealand with people overseas who are doing the same thing because then we have strength. The old thing, unity is strength and united we stand and <laughs> divided we fall. Yeah. We actually don't hear that much, do we, that no. statement? United we stand divided we fall and see the union movement in New Zealand has just essentially fallen because of well many circumstances but again it's team spirit is always another thing and just quickly how New Zealand became nuclear free was because people general New Zealanders got together and groups and organizations and got nuclear free suburbs and nuclear free towns and villages until there was something like 76% of them across the country which then gave David Longy, the Labour Party leader and New Zealand Prime Minister the mandate yeah. to then go ahead because the electorate or the people, the grassroots people led and gave them that opportunity to take it further. Yeah. Just one little correction, <laughs> because it's, I'm personally involved. Jeffrey Palmer uh, took the lead. David Long was out of the country when the decision was made. That's an aside. <laughs> <laughs> but the phrase I use quite often is, we are, therefore I am. Throughout history, you've got, I think, therefore I am. I act, therefore I am. I play, therefore I am. I worship, therefore I am. It always comes back to the egocentric self and I think we need to get out of that and go we are therefore I am that my personality is tied up in that unity 
of consciousness, that humility about being part of a greater whole. I agree with you. It's Many of my friends now are waking up in the morning and the first thought that they have is how can they make the community a better place, yeah. the world a better place, and not service the self. Yeah. Well, this is the um, reason for our peace conference, and we just hope that more people will come and see ways that they could be involved. We've asked that every presenter spends at least 30% of their presentation giving action proposals. And it's just mind-blowing that thousands will be up late into the morning watching a rugby test. I will be too, because I'm a a nutcase when it comes to (laughs) rugby. But we'll only get probably 100 or 200 people coming to our conference. So where is the value? Where is the orientation? Where is that commitment to develop a good future? Green Planet FM has always been involving itself, John, with grassroots organisations and getting people to work in little cells which can join to other clusters of cells and see how we can bring change across the nation at the most basic levels, be it farmers' market, be it neighbourhood support groups, be it homeschooling, permaculture, holistic health organic New Zealand the organic situation there's a little crowd called Ubi here in Auckland out of our own backyards where they get food organic food and they send it to all sorts of people so that they're getting fresh vital produce to eat and there are myriads of what you call non-governmental groups working towards a better future but they don't get media exposure Yes, Tim, I totally agree and congratulations for what you're doing in this so important radio station. At this conference, I'm not sure how we can do it, but it'd be good to face up the reality that internationally there are thousands of peace groups, people concerned about peace. If only we could get all of us to work together and perhaps each one take a particular action proposal and develop it, we could move mountains. We have strength, as you say, if we work together. Well, New Zealand has always, as they say, punched above its weight globally, and we've done so many fantastic things, from welfare, from emancipation of women, to the physicality of climbing Everest, and you say we've got the rugby players. We are, at the moment, in the Security Council in the UN. We've got a pivotal situation I would like to think that we can really point out our differences and the fact that we do want to be part of something greater and get the so-called non-aligned countries and say, right, how can we be really innovative to get everybody paddling in the same waka for want of a New Zealand colloquialism? Well, we do have that creativity and that willingness to stand out, which is refreshing internationally. In fact, it's difficult when some new immigrants come here. They won't do much until uh, uh, the hierarchy says they should do this as the next thing. Whereas we have a history of taking a responsibility seriously and a willingness to be even a conscientious dissenter to make a change. And uh, if we can capitalise that, if we can translate that through to our person of the United Nations it would put New Zealand in the history books. It's usually the people that do take a stand that are remembered, like Gandhi and Martin Luther King and, and so on, Tifiti of Pariharka. It's not those that uh, join the team, especially a team that's controlled by um, interests that uh, can make it very difficult for them if they don't engage with them. To be able to stand in our truth, John, even if we are part of the so-called business fraternity... I find that in New Zealand a lot of business people don't want to come out against GE or GMO because that would put them offside from the majority of people and this is just one instance and this program's been going for 12 years now and I'm still finding it difficult to see what change we've been able to initiate. Yes, there's little things happening always in the periphery but again and I think one of our biggest challenges is that 
the changes that we really need to see so that we become one people and one country have to be language from the Prime Minister's department down and I don't see this happening at all. And yet, I remember watching John Key's address in the United Nations on disarmament about a year and a half ago, two years ago, and he spoke excellently. Yeah. I was extremely impressed. <laughs> but he was outside the country, and the yeah. country didn't know it. I want to see him pull the strands of community in New Zealand and, and allow us to have that point of difference because we are in many ways a remarkable country that has become incredibly complacent at the mm. same time. Yeah. So right. I've spoken to business people that feel they can't take a stand because then they'd alienate their shareholders and it would be difficult for them. They would obey any legal constraint and we can't forget there are probably just as many people in business as in the church or any other organisation that have taken the stand. People wouldn't realise that Bob Jones has come out strongly against the nuclear arms race and you've got people like uh, Sir Tyndall Stephen Tyndall. Stephen Tyndall, Dick Hubbard and some other very prominent business people who are prepared to make a stand. So we can't just cast the people in business into the outer darkness of guilty people. There are some that are on our side and perhaps all too many that aren't. I'm speaking with Dr John Hinchcliffe, known as a philosopher, a reverend, a writer a peace campaigner, an academic and an advocate for values and ethics in education. He is a companion New Zealand Order of Merit for services to education and has edited many books in the fields of professional ethics, nuclear disarmament, sport, philosophy and religion and AUT, Auckland University of Technology, is proud to have Dr John Hinchcliffe as the very first Emeritus Vice-Chancellor of AUT University. He is here to tell us about the World Without War Action for Peace Conference on the 19th and 20th of September of this year at the Sir Rees Building and AUT University here in Auckland. This is one of the more powerful and potent Peace Foundation conferences we've had for the last 30-odd years. For more information, contact lucy.heald, H-E-A-L-D, at peacefoundation.org.nz peacefoundation.org.nz or telephone 021 770 464 021 770 or look up the peacefoundation.org.nz John, you have a chaplain at McLaurin Chapel at Auckland University and so you were there for many, many students who, if they had become lonely or were suffering from any particular ailment or whatever, they could come to you as a chaplain and get advice. They would see you as a true brother. And how are we at the moment with world religions? How are they approaching this very serious situation? Because a lot of them will be aware of prophecy yeah. and... The other thing, too, is that all human beings have a soul. We, somewhere along the line, have to recognise, particularly after our death, that there is a greater extension to our being. How does religion play into this, please? Tim, another answer must be that it's very complex and religion is multidimensional. You get Christians... Perhaps they could be called liberal or concerned about the real world that have made a difference over the years. I mean, the Reverend uh, Alan Brash who was a leader in the World Council of Churches. He was very committed and quite fiery when it came to issues relating to peace and so on. And if you look through the history of many of the religions, there are people and disciples of whatever faith who have been taking a stand often before anyone else. But at the moment, all too commonly, I'm seeing, and maybe this has always been the case, the sort of fundamentalist sect that's only concerned about the afterlife, that doesn't worry about what impact politicians have. I mean, I just read one by um, a major in the Vietnam War who said, when asked to justify 
his action about the destruction of the city of Bentray. He said, well, we had to destroy it in order to save it. So um, some fundamentalists like ISIS and so on don't care if they kill a few people because they will then be ridding them of their enemies in order to save the planet for themselves. And this is a factor in all religions, these fundamentalists who don't care, who don't put the other first, who have forgotten the word love. And that word love is preeminent in all the great religions. It's just a great shame that so many Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims and others who become so fanatical that they've got the truth in their tight little hand and no one else has and they will make sure if they don't follow their way then they don't deserve to live or because they'll never go into God's kingdom. So with your conference coming up there's uh, New Zealand churches involved? Uh, We have one session for different religions. The aim is not that they'd spell out their particular truths but how they as Christians can, and Muslims and Jews and so on can make a difference by acting, perhaps acting together, hopefully. Is there a large uptake of New Zealand's religions to want to be involved in this particular conference or the bigger picture? Uh, I can't answer that, Tim. If we judged it in terms of the number of people that wanted to speak... We'd say it's overwhelming. In fact, we've had about 200 people writing in wanting to participate as speakers. And we can only accommodate about 40, which is probably too many. So there is that interest out there. But my worry is it's just the, uh, just the few at the top or bottom who are making that stance. But we'll see when the conference starts is how many people have that sort of allegiance Not that that allegiance is important, and we may not even demonstrate it, but we do have this session on religion, so we'll be able to see how many are interested when we have that session. Are we having overseas people come to here, or are we doing video hookups so that we are essentially drawing from the greater whole so that we can get an understanding from a larger perspective, or is this a New Zealand focus? Well, we hope our focus is not just New Zealand, that we can transfer all our action proposals around the world. In terms of participation, we've only got one international presenter. He's from England, and he's been um, funded by Dr. Rob Roche. And we have sent invitations out, but they all complain that all require full payment. In 1976, we had 40 international speakers. U.S. congressmen, Nobel Prize winners, uh, leaders of countries, uh, and so on, none of whom required money because it was the privilege to speak about the subject in another country. Now that just doesn't seem to be the case. Yes, things have changed, and finance is a lot tighter too these days, John. Well, John, children. (laughs) Children... We're bequeathing what to our children. Uh, I find now that I want to focus more and more on children solely because they're still open. And I share the same thoughts that I say, look, I want this world to be for you like it has been for me when I was born over 60 years ago. (laughs) Just a youngster. (laughs) Yes. I had my cake and eat it too and I want you kids to be able to have clean water, clean air, a clean food chain, many animals and a biosphere where people live in peace and harmony and this is where I wish to focus. I think that's uh, admirable. Uh, The youth are our future and I think the difficulty for a lot of us is that we are so concerned about the planet we're leaving them that they see us a bit pessimistic. I know I sometimes give the impression that I'm pessimistic. I don't believe we can be optimistic. And we're leading the young children astray if we say everything's going to be fine and dandy. Like in Pangloss and kind of wonderful novel Candide, this is, everything is great and never saw anything as wrong. So I can't be one of the optimists. I can only say I have hope. Hope is when 
people decide that they want to make a difference, even if they are not able to, at least they're willing to make a go. They're prepared not to sit on the sidelines, but they're prepared to get into the field of play and do their bit with other people. Then I think we can have hope. Well, oh, yes. Well, I'm very fortunate, John. I, I may still have rose-tinted glasses. I'm going until the last breath. I realise that there's nothing else for me to do. And as I said, and many of my friends, we wake up in the morning and how are we going to facilitate change? And so our focus, yes, we have to have shelter. We have to have some money in our back pockets. I mean... Basically, this is a voluntary program. It always has been a voluntary program. Mm. And as you've been a major volunteer your whole life, I mean, volunteerism is in many ways the glue that pulls and keeps society coming together, isn't it? Uh, Exactly. And the fact that you're doing that is a sign of hope. And the fact that people wake up in the morning and say, what can we do? is a um, huge sign of hope. So I'm writing a book on the future and, quite frankly, look at so many of these problems. Well, 85% of the fish have gone. So many of the rivers are so polluted. Many of the rivers are drying up. The underground water supply, the aquifers are drying up and so on and so forth. It's very hard to have rose-tinted spectacles, (laughs) as I see it. As I see it, as I said, that if people are out there making an attempt to improve the situation in one area of their interest. I think then we can hope for a better world. I agree. I agree. Uh, And again, uh, we're calling listeners. We're calling all the people who are either listening here in Auckland or tapping in to the internet, greenplanetfm.com, and downloading and listening. We need your participation. It's critical and In many ways, John, I talk to all my friends and I say, this is the most important life uh, that one can have because if we are on the threshold of we have an ecological wave, an economic wave and a societal wave and they're all converging as of this moment. In 30 years' time, it will be far too late. Totally agree and that's depressing. If I could look at those words ecology and economics, uh, the word echo in Greek is home. Ology comes from the Greek word logos, means wisdom. So ecology is wisdom about the home. Economics, home, and nomos means care of. So you need wisdom about the home before you can care for the home. So if economics were genuinely tied up with the etymology of the word economics, they would be based on wisdom and there we might see a change in the financial world which has its repercussions in so many different directions the last time you were on here john in an interview we were at the start of occupy wall street and you went through the u.s um, economic system and i think we got to something like 16 trillion dollars worth of debt before we decided (laughs) to to move on but at the moment The world economic system is a casino and this is also driving so many people to be so concerned. They're struggling for money because we see that jobs have been offshored from so many countries. Even New Zealand companies now have gone up to the east and having uh, their produce produced there. That New Zealanders are in many ways struggling just to survive, to pay the rent or to pay the mortgage. And this takes their focus away from what we're talking about to lift our head above the parapet and see what's going on in the horrendously real world that we're in and then take action. Yes, yes, yes. Back when we talked about the Wall Street thing, we said the US was in debt about, what, $16 trillion? Correct. That's if you look at the, the government debt. If you add in the local body's debt... If you add in the personal debt, then as one of the top economists, I think Boston University has said, the real debt is uh, about $120 trillion, which is impossible for them to cope with. And interestingly, 
China has loaned the United States a huge amount of money and they'll be wanting America not to go under because then they'll lose all the money they've gifted. Another interesting fact in terms of bringing people together, perhaps for the wrong reasons, is that Russia has been selling the United States its uh, nuclear materials because they're breaking down their or disassembling their a lot of their old-fashioned nuclear warheads. So there's an interconnection which is quite incredible. It's nearly insane at one level. So if we all step back and say, right, we all share the same breath, we the human species, what do we find that we have in common? And I remember when I was in Russia, I always had the idea that Mikhail Gorbachev would have a grandchild sitting on his knee (laughs) and Ronald Reagan would have his grandchild sitting on his knee and then they actually have a discussion, what do they want for that child or their children? Well, yes, that's nice. Um, You know who's losing the polls for the next president of the United States? It's Donald Trump beating even Hillary Clinton on the polls. And he was quoted in the Herald the other day as saying, I'm a militarist. People have to respect America. Respect is so important. And uh, it's this, um, well, it's called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, which has actually been published as a policy in order to make sure that no one can beat America in terms of new developments, new research. And uh, that's why they have about three-quarters of or more of all the nuclear warheads that's why they've built a 52 megaton bomb when most of them are about 24 megaton bombs. They have determined that mutually assured destruction will, will save their lives. It's a, a fear-based mechanism for their survival and their so-called greatness. And it, it is mad. It's evil. It's insane. And uh, until we get a, a prisoner who's willing to stand up to them, like Eisenhower did, but right at the end of his career, we are faced with a superpower who wants this guy to be the next president. I saw a video of him the other day, and he said, the world hates us. That's a horrendous statement. And so when you have the United States, and I've lived in America twice, John, and I really had a wonderful time. I enjoyed myself immensely, and I've got heaps and heaps of good American friends, and they realise that their government has been hijacked. Yeah. It's been hijacked by the corporations and the bankers who are running the show. And America at the moment is what bases in about 150 countries on Earth, yeah. where Russia, I think, has got a base in Syria, and Russia is now the enemy of the West. Yeah. Yes, it's sad, isn't it? America's the only one that's dropped a nuclear, two nuclear weapons and on people and so on. But I lived there eight years. And some of the best people in the world are ones that I've met in America, the most concerned people. And they look to New Zealand's example as something to be admired. And I just wish there were more of them willing to or being able to take a stand. If you look at a lot of the quotes we get, it's from American the books we read, like Race to Oblivion by Rear Admiral La Roque, a former admiral in the U.S. fleet in the South West Pacific, who's seen the light. And these books, many of them, make such a huge impact. So we've got to admire so many Americans. And America, the good side of it. I mean, after the Second World War, they were saying we need peace. They were saying that we've got to talk with people about the real things of life and not weaponry and and so on. They've got to recover that vision, which was so powerful for so long. That's right. We're surrounded by challenges, John. Yeah. Everywhere there is. And so it is, it's, it's get that spark inside. I have the saying that we each have an inner candle and at heart it resides within our uh, rib cage. Yeah. We have to breathe in deep of the oxygen and get that flame burning yeah. strongly yeah. and then participate first in our family, in our homes, and then communicate with our neighbours. I mean, I don't see any other way, really, other than to make sure that we are healthy and we have got a, 
a healthy inlook as well as a healthy outlook and find our friends and communicate in little cells in your neighborhood and you get strength from that we need support from our kin our family and our friends so that we feel validated we need to have self-worth and when we get this feedback it gives us the inspiration to take that next leap precisely i think if we all said something good about somebody will what someone has done every day we could light that candle that you're talking about and take that candle outside of ourselves hold it in a hand let it lead us into a better framework and a better future agreed so john in summing up you've had you've been here more than three score and ten years and so you, when you look back and you know that your father they didn't have a car uh, in those days because they hadn't been invented we didn't have airplanes until 120 years ago you've seen incredible so-called physical and material progress how about the character of the values that we so need and the virtues that you would have been brought up in, what's happened and how can we instill these in today's human population? That is the ultimate question in my view. How can we reshape our worldview so that others will find a vision that's more important than material wealth? And quite frankly, it's a long, hard task. We need some charismatic leaders. I mean, if Richie McCaw came out and talked about loving your neighbour as yourself and showed that he could care and get down and help some poor people, it, it would take a lead and give inspiration and example to so many. But it doesn't seem to be coming uh, from the pulpit because so few people are hearing from the, hearing the pulpit. It's not coming from so many media. It's just an uphill task which all who care must take a part in. I mean, things were easier back then. We didn't have all these material objects. We spent time with each other. We joined good organisations like the Scouts and Rotary and so on. All these organisations having serious trouble about uh, continuing. Difficulty in getting membership. And I think it's partly because everyone's too busy are saving their jobs and it's going to be harder and harder to save the jobs because with the high technology or well, the new factory someone said will need a man and a dog. The dog is the guard. The man needs to feed the dog and switch the machine on. Then everything's done by the comfort of someone's home. The new, new warfare, high-tech warfare can be done by people with their computers thousands of miles away. We don't need soldiers on the ground. We don't need people working in the factory and so on, it's going to make getting livelihood even more seriously difficult. And people who want to spend their time naturally uh, earning so their families can live. I don't know what the problem, the answer to that is. There's got to be an answer. Someone out there is bound to have it and we need to see what we can do to change. And the children spend so much time looking at these, what do they call them, games on their little handheld uh, devices and well how do they spend time with each other I remember when I was young we sat in our living room by the fire and perhaps the radio was going on in the background we talked to each other and then came the time the era of the computer where we sat in our bedrooms and had our own programs to watch now they can all sit in their study or in their room and none of them is talking because they're playing their different games until we spend time with each other and work with each other and have vision together, there's very little future for us. Sharing time at the table, mum, dad and the kids and grandma and granddad as well, we have to get back to family and community values. Indeed. John, lovely. Thank you very much for coming in here and sharing your wisdom. Thank you, Tim, for sharing your wisdom and for making such a wonderful contribution to our future. Cheers, brother. That was John Hinchcliffe speaking with me about the coming peace conference, The World Without War, 
Action for Peace conference, and it's on the 19th to the 20th of September of this year at Sir Paul Reeves Building, AUT University, Auckland. And it's the purpose to develop action proposals for creating a peaceful world. Now, the conference fee is only $20 for the unwaged and $60 for the waged for this two-day event. And it's funded as a First World War centenary project, and and we want to be able to fill the hall of 400 participants. And it starts from 8 to 8.30 on Saturday morning. And there are a huge number of people who are presenting who are very prominent throughout New Zealand. It is a very full program, some exceptional communicators and some very, very potent statements about how we can get to grips with the challenges of peace and particularly with regard to the new technologies. Yes, this is about unity consciousness within New Zealand and with other people around the world. It's time for us in New Zealand to see if we can come out and show the world that we are a very potent, proud and strong country that have got ethics and values that work towards a world that we can leave for our children and grandchildren. This is a very special time. So the best way to do is to, to register by contacting Lucy Heald, H-E-A-L-D, at the Peace Foundation on 021 770 464 or contact the Peace Foundation at www.peace.net.nz that's www.peace.net.nz to be able to participate in one of the more unique conferences in the last 30 to 35 years in this country you can listen to this program five minutes after 9am by going to planetaudio.org.nz slash greenplanet that's there for the next seven days and you can iPod and stream six hours after broadcasting from greenplanetfm.com which has a huge database of interviews and holisticliving.co.nz slash greenplanetfm and itunes.com you can follow Green Planet FM on Facebook at facebook.com slash greenplanetfm. Come and love us. If you like, you can like us too. And twitter.com slash greenplanetfm. So this is Tim Lynch on greenplanetfm.com in mobilizing consciousness, wishing you in the spirit of aroha, kiakaha, and hairi ra. Thank you for tuning into this Green Planet radio show. I trust you have derived both enjoyment and insight as we empower ourselves with a greater understanding of the magnificent, multifaceted world that we inhabit. In these coming times of rapid change, it's going to take raw courage and inner resolve. And so I thank you as we all remain both focused yet relaxed as we challenge the status quo and let go of the old as we energetically co-create the new paradigm. Because I can assure you, every one of you are important now. When you go to bed tonight, ready for well-earned rest and sleep, realize that what you think, feel and do is part of your unfolding destiny. And when we commit to a higher act of goodwill and or community service, providence also lines up. So that every conversation we have, every email we send, every phone call we make and every meeting we attend, that we stand in our power and communicate intelligently, warmly, with integrity, knowing that we are actively shaping a collective future that will benefit all our children and grandchildren as well as that of the larger community. This is Tim Lynch in Auckland from Nuclear Free New Zealand and mobilizing unity consciousness, wishing you a stupendous week of heartfelt success. I say bye-bye and hari rā.